first, uh, the first of our sessions today is about the new horizons in the kind of technology and online testing that we can do. And I'm really excited that uh, Nick Hodges is going to start us off. Nick is the chief tech officer at Gorilla and obviously the power behind the throne. Um, but don't tell Joe because she's not online at the moment, so she's not hearing this. And it's certainly not being recorded. Um, so, but I see that Nick's slides are up and uh, I'll turn it over to Nick. For the rest of us, we'll just ask if you could just turn your video off and uh, make sure you're muted and we'll get going. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Joe. Uh, can you see and hear me okay? Oh, good, yeah. Wonderful. So, hello, everybody. I'm Nick from Gorilla, and I'm going to show you some of the new tools that we've been working on. So, I've really enjoyed all the talks this morning, and we've uh, it's been amazing to see all the different kind of things that people have been getting up to. Um, obviously, we talked a lot about moving lab-based research online, and in many cases, um, although not all, we've seen a fantastic array of stuff. Uh, but in many cases, it means taking the tasks that we were doing in the lab and moving, doing them online instead. Now, the benefits of doing this are, are I think, by now quite well known. It's, you know, it's faster, you can get larger sample sizes, more diverse participants, and so on. Um, but of course, we're not limited to these kinds of more traditional screen-by-screen, -screen, stimulus response, accuracy and reaction time sort of oriented tasks. There's all sorts of other things that we can do too. Um, so here at Gorilla, we've been working on some new tools to really explore these kind of different ways of researching human behavior. And I'm going to show you a few of them now. So the first one of these is the shop builder. This lets you create your own little online shop. Um, this could be anything from Amazon to Etsy to Sainsbury's, anything like that. Uh, fundamentally, you upload a list of products. Um, you give them some images and some prices. Uh, and then you let your participants go shopping and you see what they buy. Uh, you can also then manipulate the shopping experience by showing particular adverts, changing the pricing, adding labels and badges, offering swaps and things like that. So you can use the research, the shop builder to research questions like what purchasing choices do people make, uh, which labels nudge them to buy food with less sugar. Um, will they pay more for items that are more environmentally sustainable? Um, will they accept an alternative product if it's offered? So let's have a look at the shop build in action. So this is the administrative side. We're going to go and just have a look at the, the participant side first and see what that looks like. And then we'll go back to the tooling and we'll see how it's all put together. So here it is. Welcome to Hovershed Toys and Games. This is my little toy shop that I've created. Um, so you can see we've got the product categories along the top and there's a search bar there as well. The landing bit is empty. The idea is in due course, you'll be able to fill that with your own stimuli as well. Um, and then, and all these things have just been defined in my product spreadsheet. Good, I didn't know about any of these things beforehand. I just uploaded my spreadsheet with all my products in and my categories, and it's still built the shop for me. Um, as I say, mine's a toy shop, but yours could be anything, um, clothes or food or whatever. And I've just got one layer of categories, but uh, obviously you can, in fact, nest them. It then behaves like a normal shopping website. You can browse, you can search, add stuff to your basket. Um, you can change the quantities, and you see the price sort of update in real time. Um, and then when you finally uh, finished and you've chosen all the products that you want, you go to checkout, you get this nice little summary. Uh, and then finally, you um, obviously, you can go back and change it again if you want. And then finally, you see how you're finished and you um, end the task. And then obviously, you get the data of what they bought and all the other directions they went in along the way. So let's have a look at the tools. Um, these are the products. You, as I say, you specify them just in a simple spreadsheet, one product in each row, really, really straightforward. I've gone for toys, you can go for anything. Um, so they all live there. The images then get uploaded into a separate panel. But again, as that was just a big folder of images that you have somewhere, and you just upload all of those. So those were the images that you saw in my shop. Um, and those two together kind of make up the core of your shop. Right? Once you've got that, you can, you can start testing it out. Um, you can then customize the appearance. So this is where my rather fetching purple came from. Um, you can change the currency, you can change the little logo. That logo is where my publisher toys and games image came from. So you can completely customize the, the look and feel of the entire thing. So to give an example of the ways in which can, you can manipulate the shopping experience, um, let's look at badges. So this is the first uh, one of the manipulations we're going to put in. There's going to be lots more down that panel on the left. This is an early build, so it's only got this one so far. And in my example, um, I want to put a little, I'm going to try and nudge people to buy more stuff to do with animals. So I want to put a little badge called perfect for animal lovers uh, next to each product that I think would be good for kids who really love animals. Um, 
so I created a new one we're calling badge conditions. So this is the animal lovers badge. You can have more than one of these conditions and you can then use the tree to branch between two different ones if you want. Um, so the first thing is we need some images. Here are some I made earlier. Um, so there's going to be two of these. Uh, so I've got a big badge and a small one and we'll see where those go uh, in just a moment. Um, then now when I created my um, set of products, um, in my spreadsheet, I had my normal columns and I added an extra column of my own devising called animals. And I put a one next to all of the products that had something to do with animals. So in this case, it's um, Hagrid's hut in the Lego Harry Potter set. It's got Buckbeak in it so as an animal. There's a couple of Playmobil sets with, um, with animals in. There's a, a board game with bugs in it, so that counts. And then all of the teddies. So uh, across all the different categories, I've got a smattering of products uh, that all have something to do with animals. And like I say, Gurdy didn't know anything about this in advance. This has all come from my, my customization. So I stick my big and my large and my small images in, and then we add a criteria. So in this case, I want to match all the products where my animals field is equal to uh, one. Now, obviously, this is comparing it to a fixed value, but you can also compare them to the mean of the other products in the same category. So you can do sort of more kind of algorithmic labeling like that. So let's see how that looks. Um, so let's go and look around. Um, there we go. There's Hagrid's hut with my little badge on it. Um, if we go through the other categories, we'll see that they're coming up as well. Now, obviously, this is a contrived example, but um, you can see how you could use this for any for all sorts of labeling experiments um, and then see what the outcome is as to what people buy. Um, you'll also notice that so we see the large um, image whenever we're browsing, but that little small paw print image comes back up in our in our basket on the right. So even after you've moved on from um, your initial shopping, and I'll move on to a different category, you still got a reminder of which ones fulfill your value criteria. And you can have either or uh, what you want. So like I say, this is still early days for the shop builder. There are many more aspects of the shop you can configure in due course. Let's go on to the next one. So this next one is called the journey builder. Um, here you can create a second set of screens that can be navigated between, sort of like a point and click adventure. Now these could represent a physical space like a shop or, or a neighborhood. They could represent a temporal space, like what happened on each day, and you navigate between the days. Or they could represent a conversation, so you click uh, of what you what click what you want to say, and then in the next screen has uh, what the person says back to you. Um, as well as navigating, the idea is you then place additional interactions on some of the screens, which are probably the interactions that you're interested in. So this could be buying a product or accusing a suspect or something like that. And the kind of things um, that you can research with this tool is, um, so how does the way a participant navigate this space affect their decision making? What proportion of people choose to go up to the shop counter first versus browse the shelves? What proportion of participants who have seen a particular piece of evidence go on to return a guilty verdict? Um, so here we go. Here's an example, um, again, it's more shopping. Sorry about that. Um, in this case, uh, participants have been told to go to a pharmacy and buy some medicine. So you start outside the pharmacy, we click to go inside, and we get this nice little crossfade effect as we, we move inside. And then we're faced with some choices. Where shall we go? We can go to some of the shelves, we can go up to the counter. Um, it's up to us. I think in this case, we go to the cold and flu shelf, which is what we've been told to do. Uh, and then we are faced with some options. So we can go and just choose one of them, or we can ask the staff for advice. Um, now, if we if we just choose, if we just um, click on one and chose it, we get set some. But look, we asked the staff, and they said, "Remember, there's more. There are different remedies behind the counter. So let's go behind the counter and see what we can get." Um, so now we go up to the counter, and this is an example of a very simple conversation tree. Uh, so we ask the pharmacist for help, and he says, "I can provide different medicines to those are on the shelf," and then we can click and have a look at some of those. Um, and then, as you can see, this is obviously a mock-up. Um, we then get offered certain products. Now, if we just gone to the shelf, we've been offered different products, we might have chosen one of those. So we can see that we make different decisions based on where we go. Um, and then finally, the game builder. So uh, this lets you create simple 2D games with sort of animations and particle effects. You've actually already seen this this morning in Dorothy Bishop's talk, um, which was built in these two links. And I've got some demos of some other ones for you as well. So in terms of research, um, these are probably measuring more similar kind of things to the more traditional tasks, like accuracy or reaction time. But where they really come into their own is um, uh, you can give much more visual communication. You can easily make buttons pulse or light up to give the participant hints to what to do. Um, you can give encouraging feedback and create an interesting fiction to really um, get people much more engaged and get them much more willing to complete the task. And, and I think as many other people have said, they're especially good with kids who might otherwise struggle to make it through a more sort of conventional task. 
So let's see a bunch of these in action. These are a bunch of demo, a bunch of games that we made for uh, Nickel Sharma at UCL, and these are all focused on um, on they measure motor abilities in different ways. So this is the first one. This is super simple. Um, you just have to pop as many balloons as you can. Now you could just do this with a button. You've got to tap the buttons many times, but actually just with a little bit of fiction and some particle effects, you get a much nicer experience. In this one, you have to trace the bees and um, and uh, repeat the pattern. Like here, you can see it, each one pulses as you're meant to click it, so it's really obvious what you're supposed to do. If you're too slow, the bees fly away. Um, so the sort of whole fiction really adds to it. Um, in this one, again, we use this is the fireworks one. Uh, you've got to set the fireworks off in order. Again, we use the fuses to uh, to show the the sort of temporal aspect of this and to give you the timing information. Again, they pulse when they're ready to go. I think in this one, the idea is you have each finger over uh, one of the fireworks. And finally, my personal favorite, the train. So you've got to drive the train from the start to the finish. Um, and you do this by holding your finger over the locomotive. But you've got to keep your finger there, because if your finger, the further your finger just away from the locomotive, the slower it goes. So you'll see here, as my sort of cursor falls away, the train slows down and stops. Uh, so you've got to get your train all the way around, keeping your finger there. So it's a really nice sort of tracing task, but dressed up in this way that it's not particularly clear to the participant exactly what they're being tested on. Oh, excuse me. Uh, that is a sort of whirlwind tour around some of the new tools we're doing. Uh, we will be running beta programs for all of these tools. So if you're interested in using them, do go to gorilla.sc slash coming soon and um, tell us the tools you're interested in. And we'll let you know when there's something to have a look at. Um, there's, of course, plenty of work happening on our cool tools uh, in the task builder and the questionnaire builder. Uh, we'll also be looking at multiplayer very soon. So stay tuned for that. Um, and that is me. Many thanks, Nick. Yeah, really yeah. fantastic. Um, I, I mean, again, all of those were, were really impressive and they look like they would just be, well, first they look like they'd be fun to play with, I got to admit. Um, <laughs> but the, the output is going to be really cool and very engaging. What got you guys doing these three builders? I mean, what were the motivations that, that drove these? I, I get Dorothy's, you know, perhaps for the games, but, um, but the storefront opportunity and the Navigator one? Uh, so they've all been born out of um, different pieces of consultancy work that we've done. And one of the, um, the things that we found is that um, after we've done a few pieces of individual consultancy work for different clients, um, there's often a more general version of that that we think would be more widely available. So the, the thing we're always trying to do is find a way to take these kind of um, tools and these abilities and go, okay, what's the sort of more general purpose, easy to use, generic version of this that we could roll out to everyone? Um, so we can get things from um, a sort of, uh, from a sort of consultancy space where things are very bespoke and often tied into that particular piece of research, which is great for that particular um, research project because it's, it's perfectly tuned to their needs. Um, but there's often other things we need to do in order to get it out to everybody else. So, so presumably it's um, recognizing commonalities there and then moving away from just reinventing 80% of the wheel each time. To, Precisely, uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. Mm. And, and I think the other nice thing about that is that these are all things that have sort of been where the trail has been blazed and the ideas have been proven. So it's not stuff that we've just kind of made up. Right. Um, there, there, is, there is absolutely a, um, a sort of solid base of work that's gone on beforehand to um, make it clear that we're, we are creating something valuable and something that's useful. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can, I can totally see that. And I can see even from an academic perspective that um, all of those tools would be incredibly valuable you know, options. I think about, you know, all the different things that come up in the space of navigation in terms of like mm -hmm. causal cognition arguments and, um, you know, decision making in terms of navigating a, a journey like a narrative versus, mm -hmm. um, you know, actual navigation tasks like, you know, the, I don't know if you've seen Sea Hero Quest. Which yes, is a, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah it's really, really nice. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things are, are incredibly mm -hmm. useful. Mm -hmm. I think that Gaia Sharif is in the process of, of sharing her slides, but I can't see them yet. I don't know whether I well. I, let me stop sharing mine. <laughs>